From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deckard. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. And that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. A storm is rolling in on a fair metropolis of Atlanta, Georgia. What better time? to share some strange stories with you. Now, folks, if you are a longtime listener to this show, you know that we have had UFOs, <coughs> excuse me, pardon me, UAPs on our mind for quite a while now. It is an exciting time for skeptics and true believers alike. Throw some cold water on that one real quick. Uh, no official government statements have mentioned extraterrestrials. But it seems increasingly clear that world powers believe there is something up there in the sky, something that at this point cannot be explained. And this inspired us to look back through UFO history, to search through the various files, uh, our wish list of episodes we wanted to cover. We wanted to search for incidents that seemed most likely to be something other than the usual explanation, not just in our opinion, but in popular consensus. And when you're talking about UFOs, when you're talking about things that cannot be explained, you need to look to one of the most infamous stories in the canon, one that people still argue, beggars explanation. See, I'm using beggars. Uh, we need to introduce you to a guy named Lonnie Zamora, Sergeant Lonnie Zamora. Who is he? Well, here are the facts. He's got an objectively kick-ass name. Um, it's not the name he was born with, but either way, regardless of, you know, whatever name, a rose is a rose is a rose, I guess. He is still a dream witness for any extraordinary encounter. You could not cast a better person. So maybe we can learn a little bit about him and what happened to him. Lonnie Zamora was born on September 7th, 1933 in Magdalena, New Mexico. Uh, United States of America. His birth name was Dionisio E. Zamora. Uh, he was a career law enforcement officer. He was a work a day kind of fellow. Um, he, you know, owned a home like anyone else. Um, and this was all in his home state there in New Mexico. He had hobbies. He had a spouse. All of the usual things that go along with with just being kind of like a reputable member of society. Um, it's also super important to note that he did not have any uh, history or um, indications of being interested in ufology whatsoever. He had no history of making wild outlandish claims. If anything, he seemed like a super together, uh, thoughtful guy who just kind of wanted to go to work and come home and eat his dinner and, uh, and you know, just live life. Yeah. And, and he holds a position of authority as a law enforcement officer. Right. This is somebody that you want to have a UFO experience because you can it feels at least on the surface if you're hearing the story like you can trust that person. Yeah, this is part of the pickle, as we will see. His life was set to continue as per normal until he retired and, you know, passed away peacefully one day. But everything changes for Zamora in April. One April afternoon, late afternoon, 1964, the story as he recalls it, we'll give it to you uh, from a couple of perspectives. We may jump around a little bit in time, but that's a, that's a bit of a presentation license on our part. So Zamora is chasing a speeding car south of a town called Socorro, New Mexico. If you are not from the area, if you are not interested in UFO phenomenon, you have probably never heard of Socorro, New Mexico. It's, it's never going to be a town that has a population uh, big enough to really hit international news, except for this story. <laughs> so he's chasing this car, and it's, it's looking like things are going to get hairy. Any law enforcement in the audience knows what we're talking about. All of a sudden, he hears a roar. 
he sees a flame in the sky, about a half mile or a mile away, a blue-orange flame, and he sees what appears to be something descending to the earth. At first, he later told New Mexico State Police and other agencies, uh, due to the closeness of the, of the thing to the, to the ground, he thought a dynamite shack may have exploded. So he let whomever is in this speeding car go free. He cut him loose. Lucky day for that guy. And instead, he traveled toward the explosion a little after 5.45 p.m. This is April 24th. Sergeant Zamora calls the dispatch for the Socorro police, and he reports a possible motor vehicle accident. And he tells dispatch, look, I'm going to go down and I'm going to check on what I think may be a, a crash, a possible down vehicle. And he sees a shiny object about 150, maybe 200 yards away. So put yourself in that mindset, two football fields away. For most people, that's just far enough away to see something like a lens flare or a, uh, a piece of metal if the light hits it right. And, and and Ben, just quick scene setting here. It's We are in a dry creek bed, or uh, it's yes, as described uh, as – yeah, an arroyo in the stories. Um, so at that point, there's not a ton of water rushing through. It's it's a, more of a dry creek bed, maybe a little bit of water in a stream. Yeah, great point. It's an it's an indentation in the ground, basically a pretty big one, mm -hmm. big enough for a car to run into trouble. Uh, so he thinks he's looking at this thing. He's walking towards it, and he's saying, "Okay, this looks like it's a it's a white vehicle of some sort. It's overturned. Uh, maybe it's." on its radiator, maybe it's on its trunk. He gets closer. This doesn't seem to be the case. As he approaches, he says, well, this is not your garden variety Ford. Instead, he observes it is, quote, like aluminum. It was whitish against the Mesa background, but not chrome. And it was shaped like the letter O. What? <laughs> that was perfect. Wait, yeah, leave the cat in. That's hilarious. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like it was like an egg. It was smooth as eggs because it, you know, it looked kind of like an egg. Well, and the weirdest part is that this is uh, this is not just an object that Zamora claims to have seen. At one point in this experience, this uh, observation, he says that he saw human beings or people like things. They, were, they looked like humans wearing, what did he describe it as? Coveralls? Coveralls. Yeah, yeah, white coveralls. And he even went so far as to say they didn't look like people because he is questioned. There's this call, and he specifically says they look like people, but he does, you know, I mean, he's describing them. Again, we've described this guy as like a kind of regular fellow. This was something that sort of was beyond his uh, experience and his expectations. So he was describing it the best he could in as straightforward a way as possible. Um, but yeah, it was some figures, right? White figures. Yeah, yeah. And he has a great quote here. He's essentially describing them as humanoid. He says they were normal in shape. Possibly they were small adults or large kids. And and I love that because he's like, who are these tremendous children? Yes. <laughs> and he, so he's, he's here and he's in a very, if we could all exercise some empathy for the guy here, he's in a very strange situation. He's just let someone go for breaking the law, right? Because he thinks there might be lives at risk instead of a speeding ticket. And as he gets closer, he hears another tremendous roar and he, and it makes him think there's an explosion, right? So he he's trained. He knows to hightail it. And as he hears this sound, he watches a blue and orange series of flames sprout from beneath this object, propelling it up and away into the sky. Now consider the time and the time zone, right? So now it's we're get we're getting closer to 6 p.m. or so and it is April, which means there's still some daylight, right? So he can see this pretty clearly. That's going to be important later. So he's like he gets out from under his car. He dove under his car and mm -hmm. he, yeah, he, he's smart. Yeah, and he calls uh he calls dispatch again. Right after, and the uh, the dispatch person he's speaking to is an individual named Nep Lopez, and he basically says, "Nep, can you look out the window? I, I just want to know if you see anything." And Nep looks out the window and uh, basically says, "Well, 
what what am I looking for here, Sergeant? And Zamora says, uh, it's, it's balloon-like in shape because he's looking at it himself while he's on dispatch. And he's talking while he's talking with dispatch about this, another sergeant for New Mexico State Police uh, named Chavez hears this and goes to his location, knows where he's at. And he comes up and he's basically saying, what's all the hubbub, bub? And then that's when... Zamora describes to Chavez what just happened. He's still kind of weirded out by this very extraordinary series of events. Chavez walks with him, and they find burning brush. They find track mark-like things or indentations. That's important because it gets exaggerated in the telling of the story later as it becomes part of UFO folklore. And then more officers arrive, and they all see the same thing. So these are multiple witnesses who are trained to think critically about what they are observing. This is the beginnings of what some ufologists consider one of the most credible sightings in history. And as we've established, whether you are a cab or whether you are super back the blue, police officers are trained to be observant. And so if you are a ufologist, you can't ask for a better witness. This guy's colleagues respect him. He's considered well-trained. He's known to have an eye for detail. He keeps his calm. Not not to mention, I mean, the the, the training too, you know, everything that police officers end up touching uh, has to be kept to a certain level of rigor in order for it to uh, hold up in a courtroom. And a big part of that is training as far as what the credibility of a witness might be. So to your point, Ben, I mean, yeah, this is someone who has the training of what a witness, what makes for a credible witness. Um, and this is a person that's going to be looking for those kinds of things and remembering these kinds of things because that's how they're trained to react and to observe. Yes, I completely agree. And I want to just stay there for a second uh, because I, we're all saying the correct things here. And we're, I think you guys are absolutely right. This guy's trained. He's credible. He did just enter into a high speed car chase, right? So no matter how trained you are, your body does certain things with adrenaline and you can, you can train your body to respond right to those natural things that it does. Um, but he just was doing that. Then he saw something alarming, like af- like as he's in the act of that high adrenaline, uh, activity, then he goes and sees something that is out of his experience and kind of weird and freaky. And then he, uh, and watches it fly off into the air, which is even more strange. I'm just saying that uh, Zamora's adrenaline must have been crazy high throughout that entire thing to the moment that he dives underneath his his cruiser as this thing is taking off again. That'd probably be peak adrenaline right there at that mm-hmm. point, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, and, and he's, he's not shy about it either, which is the interesting part. I mean, you know, you, you, you talk about, a, a career lawman, you know, who, um, you know, basically stakes their reputation on being credible, um, and being, you know, considered a safe individual, you know, in a small community like this, um, he's perfectly willing to talk about this openly, which I think is really commendable and, and kind of interesting. And he does so uh, very soon after um, on a radio show, KSRC Radio. Uh, we actually have a great transcript of a conversation that he has with, uh, I believe, the, the DJ or the person that's interviewing him is a person named uh, Schrode. I'm not sure, Ben, is this, the, is this like, a, like a talk show, like morning drive time type host or what, what, like public uh, interest kind of segment? Yeah, Walter Walter Schrode. So we uh, we thought we could do just a quick uh, just a quick indication. I guess I'll I'll take this more parts since I was already kind of butchering his voice. You can hear uh, as Noel, as you and Matt point out uh, off air, you can hear the audio of this. But we thought it would be fun to do a little little dramatic retelling. So I know here who wants to be Schrode, but here we go. Uh, the guy says. These are just snippets. Uh, It says, I went up that little road for about half a mile, I guess. Came up to this little parking area there on the side of the road. And I thought I'd glance out of the window, look to my left and seen this white object on the ground. Thought there might be a car. They turned over. 
crossed over to go out there to investigate, thought maybe somebody might be hurt. At that time, I saw this white egg, like egg-shaped looking object. Can I just interject real quick to say, Ben, you are nailing his cadence and (laughs) calmness, which I think is the most important detail here. He's saying it very matter-of-factly. He's not telling a spooky story. He's describing a memory. You know what I mean? Again, I hope I'm not coming on too strong and, like, really putting all my my conspiracy eggs in this guy's egg basket. Um, But I just do believe that this man believes what he saw. And, Ben, I think you did a great job of nailing that tone. So, Matt, you you want to do Schrode since I'm being Mr. Interjection here? Yeah, I'll be Schrode. That it looked like an egg, you mean? Yeah, from that distance, it... It looked like an egg to me. About the size of a car, I think someone said. Yes, sir. It it looked like a car that turned over. Therefore, I would say about the size of a car, (laughs) which is like, to your point, Noel, (laughs) that's like... Yeah, it's a very yeah, matter- this guy's about as matter of fact as you could possibly be. Well, I did say it looked like a car that had turned over. Therefore, I would say about the size of a car. <laughs> I know. It's Thank you very much. Uh, uh, no, yeah, no, he yeah. like he he talks more about uh, he talks more about the figures uh, that he saw nearby again. Those couple of folks that well folk shaped things. <laughs> I guess we should say. Uh, let's let let's go to that. Because this just further cements your point, Noel. Uh, it's 1964, so uh, Schroeder is smoking. I don't know if he actually was. <sighs> Did they have helmets on, like spacemen or anything? Uh, no, sir. I, I wouldn't say that they were people. I just, uh, I just saw something white, white coveralls. That's all I can say. But you couldn't identify them as actually being an actual human being, like like you or I. Uh, no, no, sir, I, I could not, which is interesting. So pause there, which is interesting because you see what the interviewer is doing here. Yes. The interviewer is taking this guy's literal retelling and kind of putting a narrative on it. Like, so you can't say they're human. And he's like, well, I can't say anything really. They could have been scarecrows. I don't know. Uh, but again, the thing is, this guy is sticking to his guns, his credibility, and people in general believe Zamora. The FBI comes out. Air Force investigators from Project Blue Book come out. They visit to get a more in-depth account, particularly the description of a strange logo on the side of the object. And eventually, this thing known as the Zamora incident goes down in history as one of the very few events Project Blue Book had to categorize as unknown. So today's question, what actually happened? We're going to pause for a word from our sponsor, and then we'll dive in. Here's where it gets crazy. To this day, and please listen carefully, folks, there is no official conclusion. There's also no shortage of theories ranging from secret government testing to foreign adversaries to extraterrestrial or even extra dimensional beings to what explanation we might save for the end. But at this point, guys, I got to ask you, Noel, Matt, what were what were some of your favorite really out there theories you read? There was one you mentioned, Noel, that I particularly enjoyed off air. Yeah, I was, you know, I was watching a YouTube uh, video about this and it was one of those things where I was kind of listening to it and not watching it while I was doing other stuff and, and reading other articles. And it was very in depth and, you know, talked about the set the scene beautifully the way we've just done and had even some clips of the interview that we just reenacted. And then about halfway through, I kind of realized, oh, this is a a very clear uh, Christian um, podcast or Christian YouTube channel. And uh, they started talking about how there's a war waging between the light and the dark and the angels and devils and uh, referring to Satan as like a manipulator of DNA and a mad scientist and all this stuff. And never quite heard (laughs) it discussed in that light before. But uh, yeah, the idea of Satan, the mad genetic scientist, and that these aliens were most definitely the the Nephilim, uh, which we've described, I believe, as kind of proto uh, angels on Earth that were, I believe, giants, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. Yes, that's mm. one of the beliefs. Yeah. The sons of God and the daughters of man. That's right. And this was uh, this was unequivocally presented as the 
the solution, hands down. Mm. And no, no shade on anybody's religion, but it's, uh, you know, it was just, it really hit me uh, out of left field, kind of like a ton of bricks, because it went from this very kind of unsolved mysteries vibe to like this hardline biblical interpretation of the whole thing. Yeah, it's the coveralls. That's what gave it away. That's right. Yep. <laughs> Everyone knows that angels wear coveralls. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you guys what the coveralls and the egg shaped object made me think. And I'll just give you my theory right here. I think Is it in 1964. Oh. <laughs> Oompa Loompas. No, I think this incident is the inspiration for the entire Mork and Mindy series uh, of the character <laughs> of Mork, of the Orkins, uh-huh. of the egg, which uh, the egg was a primary uh, in, uh, piece in that show. And I believe it was the spaceship. I think it was an egg shaped spaceship. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong there. That's what I see in my mind. Uh, Guys, I think that's what it is. They were testing, like they were going to do a pilot 14 years or 12 years before Mork and Mindy came out. (laughs) These theories are going in the description of this episode. Angels wear coveralls. (laughs) Nephilim Nephilim have a dress code. Uh, Mork and Mindy, this was their first pilot. Uh, So... (laughs) So let's let's think about this. Okay, maybe we stay with that. Maybe we go with the exciting stuff. There are factual things that are really exciting and strange about this. Not one, but three separate federal agencies ended up investigating the Zamora incident. The Army, the FBI, the Air Force, right, under the auspice of the Blue Book Project. And none of those three could explain what might have occurred. Even... Uh, Even a guy named J. Allen Hynek, who up to that point was a very skeptical Blue Book investigator, eventually found himself at a loss to explain this story. It was too detailed. It was too corroborated. It was too credible. You know what? I pause, guys. I think maybe we we need to just tell people what Project Blue Book is if they haven't heard the episode yet. This is the ancestor of what what recently came out with the UAP... Uh, an a tip investigation right so if if we could say it in a, in just a like a couple phrases, what is project blue book i mean it 's essentially like the the only government sanctioned uFO investigation program that we really know about um, you know it was a collection of reports and data surrounding the potential existence of uFOs specifically as it pertains to national security, and then it was abandoned. Presumably because no one in government thought it uh, had any bearing on national security anymore. Yeah. And we do have a whole episode on this, right? I know we do because we talk about Project Sign, which is the predecessor to Blue Book. There was Grudge also was a thing we talked about. These are all just attempts by the U.S. government to explain unidentified flying object incidents, like specific sightings and incidents uh, and uh, categorize them, right? It's a threat assessment, basically, by just looking at each individual thing. Mm-hmm. And it has, uh, yeah, do check out our episode on this. You just need to know, if you are not aware already, that Uncle Sam and multiple other world governments have been investigating allegations of UFOs for a very, very long time. And they've been doing it with good reason. They've been doing it with uh, a rationale behind it. So it's no surprise that these folks would check out Zamora's story, but they weren't the only ones because, you know, as you had pointed out, Noel, Zamora had no compunction about going to the public with this. He was as mystified and confused as anybody else. He would love for there to be a mundane explanation. So non-government actors... Private investigators got on board with this. Uh, Reporters from like the AP, Associated Press, United Press International, they turned up. They were on the story. And then early investigation bodies of private citizens like APRO, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, and uh, places like NICAP, which has really missed the opportunity to go by NICAP. People would just remember it more easily. National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. Uh, Let's spend some time with those guys. They sent teams to the area. One of their investigators, a guy named Ray Stanford, discovered corroborating witnesses. Because remember, uh, Chavez and the other members of the police force 
saw burning brush. They saw evidence of burns on the ground, but they saw those after the fact. This guy, Stanford, uh, seems to have found witnesses who were plugged in or, or, or were able to in some way corroborate aspects of Zamora's account. Uh, and they did it before this hit the national news. Yeah, there's one one witness, I believe, were they in Albuquerque? I think they're in Albuquerque, who actually saw whatever this thing was, this oval-shaped object flying, or at least floating in some way, traveling, let's say, through the air, uh, around 5.30 p.m. on the night that Zamora saw this object as well. Yeah, and then there was a... Um Let's see, there, there was another example at 5.30 p.m. This person in Albuquerque calls in to the authorities to say, hey, I saw an oval object and it's flying really low and it's kind of slow and it looks like it's headed toward uh, this nearby town, well, you Socorro. Know, it, it, the whole description of the shape, I mean, it's so interesting to me because would this have been out in any real way other than on the wire, not the wire, but like rather like the CB kind of system, you know, for uh, for the dispatch? Like, aren't, aren't these other sightings people that would not have been privy to any of that chatter? Yes, that's correct. And yeah. the timeline yeah. is Just making important. sure. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've seen up. other instances where people were describing similar things, but they also had – reports that they had seen of that shape like the the kites the shaped ones with a, i think it was a drone situation of like formation of, of drones that we talked about recently but with this one it's like there's no reason for people to just pull that shape out of you know the thin air literally and it's also not a typical flying saucer shape this is definitely the first egg like a ufo or, or U, uap that i've ever uh heard about i don't know about you guys well i mean there's there are reports of round objects like that that are kind of oval in nature that have, I mean, if you look through Project Blue Book, stuff that was seen in the air floating strangely and looked kind of like an egg that were, in fact, weather balloons or, or other balloons. Oh, that's a good point. They were weather balloons and or they were uh, or they would be described with series of lights running horizontally or something like that. But but you nailed it because the idea here is that if somebody is purposefully or accidentally misreporting something because they've been primed by earlier stories of uh, weird stuff in the sky, then they're probably going to go with the most common reported thing, which at that point would have been the disc-shaped flying saucer. But other corroboration occurs – there were also several witnesses who claimed to clearly remember hearing that loud roar around the same time Zamora claimed, or the same times, I should say, because some people reported hearing it twice. The one that he said he heard after the thing was taking off. It turned out, in fact, that three separate people had independently contacted the Socorro police to report something strange in the sky around this time. And those reports all came before Zamora's account hit the news. And this means if we're thinking logically that at the very least, multiple people saw something, or you could say that Zamora conspired with multiple people for some sort of elaborate hoax because they were bored and TikTok wasn't a thing yet. I don't know. That asks a lot. Uh, but the, yeah. the first idea that people saw something at the very basis, I think that feels solid because it's not making any claims about the nature of what they saw. It really could have just been, to your point, Matt, a balloon. Yeah. I mean, it could it could have very well been that. Who knows? We'll get into some more, some more of those things, I think, towards the end here. At least the like the highly skeptical version of this story that's that's out there. But here here's the thing. Even days later, people were still seeing things. Or at least, you know, maybe again, as you said, Ben, they're primed now with the story kind of coming out and starting to spread. But on April twenty sixth, which is two days after the initial Zamora incident and sighting, there were other witnesses who were saying they saw something out there that was quote, shaped like a butane tank. Uh, and it was landing on the ground. And if you imagine the flames that are described by Zamora, 
you can kind of imagine a butane tank open that's like spewing out flames, maybe that was lit on fire or a rocket of sorts. Um, and that, that's what it feels like to me, just flames spewing out of a small opening in this metal shape. Totally, 100%. And then they did recall seeing it take off again with the same blue-white flame they described it as. Uh, there were also, in in this guy's investigation, and again, he, the guy we're talking about here, Stanford is a private citizen doing this. He's not working for the government. Uh, he finds that at this site that people are describing a few days later, there are also four large indentations on the ground with several smaller, rounder ones and a burned circular patch of ground that he feels clearly marks the landing site. Now, there are a lot of ways that surface area can get burned, obviously, but still it looks weird. And that inspires people to talk about cover-ups. It's time. Mm -hmm. Coveralls and cover-ups, baby. There we go. Nailing it. Uh, yeah, Uncle Sam comes to interview Zamora on the 25th. And weirdly enough, the FBI and the Army kind of team up. There's an Army captain named Richard T. Holder who comes essentially because he is uh, the most senior officer available at White Sands, which is a base nearby. And he posses up and arrives at the scene with a guy named Arthur Burns. Arthur Burns works for the FBI. And they interview him kind of the way, you know, they, they probably give him maybe not the third degree, but they're definitely thorough uh, the way that our old pal Viking got the shakedown in the, uh, Wells Fargo in Idaho. Uh, they Zamora the says, <laughs> they give him the old what for, just so. And Zamora says, you know, maybe I saw some sort of secret government experiment i don't know you guys are the you, you got we're on the same side but you guys are the expert and that sort of stuff and what's funny is captain holder shut that one down so quickly he even went to the press not too long after and said look the military has quote no object that would compare to the objects described by zamora and that is the origin point the genesis of the allegations of cover-up that continue today so, you know, you will tend to see ufologists like James E. McDonald arguing in this case that like, you know, G-men were taking samples of fused sand, quote unquote, for analysis and then suppressed the findings. Uh, you also have some pretty blatant backstage tensions between Zamora and Chavez and the guys that are, you know, on the scene uh, representing Project Blue Book who arrived four days after the event, and of course, you know, a lot, of, a lot of weight being thrown around, I imagine, you know, you always see it in movies where you got a local jurisdiction, uh, a local investigation, and then the big boys from, from the big city come in, and it's, it's, never, it's never fun, it's never like, there's always some kind of like weird, uh, uh, you know, sense of being at odds, uh, but that happens on April 28th, again, four days after the, the initial event, and the officer's were annoyed, of course, that the Blue Book uh, team were insisting that it was a hoax because in their mind, that's slandering their buddy Zamora, uh, who in particular was offended so much that he actually refused to speak with Hynek at all. Yeah, and you can understand that because this is the kind of guy who doesn't want to be seen as a crackpot or a kook, you know, and his umbrage is completely rational at this point. But this becomes a tipping point for Hynek. This is going to change the course of Hynek's career because he said, you know what? I work with the evidence I have and I try to do my best to think critically about this evidence. And what I'm seeing here tells me that not only may there be some sand fused or otherwise to this story, but I'm starting to wonder whether the military and ultimately the U.S. government and the Pentagon, I, I wonder if they're even interested in actually finding the truth or if they just want to sort of shoehorn things into a narrative. And then he starts taking shots at the, uh, at, at the establishment. Later, he writes, when he's talking about the Zamora incident, later he says, I think this case may be the Rosetta Stone. There's never been a strong case with so unimpeachable a witness. And then later... 
talking about the Air Force, he says, the Air Force doesn't know what science is. He go, uh, And also, we should mention, Hynek later goes on that same show with Schrode, where, uh, where Zamora had been earlier, and he said, look, they're not allowing me to, I'm not supposed to talk about the markings on the craft. And Zamora reported seeing markings. Later witnesses who are a little, maybe less reliable, reported seeing some kind of marking. We're not saying they're less reliable because they are um, bad faith actors necessarily. We're saying it because they were civilians looking at stuff from the ground. So, you know, like, they, and they were far away, or this thing was already high in the air, even if it was at a low altitude. Uh, but maybe we talk a little bit about that symbol. That's kind of cool. We've got a picture of it. I, I just snuck in here. Artist rendition, because there's not a photograph. Uh, it looks to me kind of sinister in the way it's in the way it's painted here. Yeah, you guys want to describe it, or someone want to take a crack at it? Yeah, I'll tell you what it looks like. Uh, it's a moderately curved line at the top. It's red in this instance. And it's, um, let's say, twice the length of a very similar line that is below that one. Okay? And it's centered. It's a the smaller. on the Blair Witchy side. I mean, it's got like a occultic kind of vibe to it. What did you say? It Maybe. It also doesn't look like much of a symbol at all. I uh, just have to be honest. Uh, it looks like it could be folds on, you know, the way some fabric is folded and it appears to look like lines from shadow. Uh, but but let me just finish describing these. Uh, the line sure. up top, half of that line below it, and in between those two lines, there is an arrow that starts uh, near the the smaller line on the bottom, moves upward, and then the pointed part or crescent part kind of is uh, just below the large line. Yeah, what what's your take? Now that's a very the side up. Let, let, yeah, exactly. <laughs> let me. I I just put in another one in our notes here. Uh, if you check out this other link, I just I just dropped this in. Uh, what you'll see is another interpretation where that top horizontal line becomes curved, like an upside down U, which makes it look mm. even more like this side up. You know what I mean? Or balloon inflates this way. <laughs> or balloon inflates this way. Oh, what are we talking about? We'll pause for a word from our sponsor, and then we'll take the uh, take a little more skeptical approach. All right, we're back. Here's the skeptical approach. Part and parcel of understanding something is that we need to look at look at it from as many sides and perspectives as possible. Yes, there is no proof right now of extraterrestrials visiting what we call planet Earth. At this point, the most plausible theory for something like that is the hilariously named panspermia concept. Uh, yep, real thing. Uh, also, there's no publicly acknowledged nor publicly available physical evidence of what happened that April afternoon in New Mexico so many decades ago. But... The kicker is that it is, I think, the only one of these encounters or one of these situations that uh, Project Blue Book documented where they didn't have a reasonable um, explanation for it. Yeah, it's one of the few. It's one of the very few where they just had to put it under their miscellaneous category, unknown. Secondly, the primary witness, the protagonist in this story, up to this point, had an impeccable rep. Uh, and one of the investigators even turned on his chain of command. He felt their motive suspect. Also, might not know this, folks, the Air Force prepared not one, but two reports regarding the events in Socorro on April 24th, 1964. Kind of like the recent Pentagon report, where one was really scant and uh, it was for the public, and it was basically like, we need more money. And then the second one was classified. It was for Congress. And a heavily redacted version of that just came out recently, but it is heavily redacted. Uh, so maybe we talk a little bit about those, those two different reports because the thing about those two different reports is they're very different. At times, they appear to contradict one another. So the first report... Um 
that was put together for public consumption highlighted some of the obvious errors throughout the investigation, all of which um, were, in fact, true. Um, how discreetly uh, and purposefully rendered those errors might have been, at least at a higher level of the Air Force, is uh, still a subject for debate. Um, a second report, however, uh, prepared by Major Hector Quintanilla, uh, the director of Project Blue Book at the time, went to the CIA, and the public didn't learn about that one until the two thousands. Um, and it totally doesn't jibe with the public report that we talked about a minute ago, the, the, the very first one. Um, they say, and if there was no doubt that Zamora witnessed something that evening and go and goes on to say that unlike what the public would hear, uh, quote, there was no question and quote, regarding his reliability as a witness. Um, a particularly telling line uh, was that he was puzzled by what he saw. And frankly, so are we. Yeah, that's mm. in the report. So when they were talking to the public, they said, this is how the investigation got messed up on multiple fronts, uh, heavily insinuating that therefore any conclusions would be tainted or contaminated by lack of methodology. But the second report, when they're talking to the CIA, they say, mm, I don't know, though. Just between us, I don't know. I don't know, you guys. There was I don't know. something on the wing. Uh, no, but there was something <laughs> there, right? Like, they're definitely, yeah, I, I, and I think that makes the most sense. He definitely saw something. What he saw, though, is what should be in question. Like, what was that thing? What could it actually be? And I think that's where the skeptic side really comes in here. What is it with our government that we have to act like we know everything all the time? Like, this is obviously a report that was not intended for people to read, at least for a very long time. But why not just come out and say, yeah, that was weird. It's, we're with you. It's control we don't understand issues. either. Control I issues, know. dude. I know. I know. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Personally, I would respect it if if there if there was that kind of transparency. Actually, at all levels. If if there were um, a politician or a president who just stopped doing the song and dance of ideology in the past and just said, "Look, they got the lithium. We want the lithium. We're going to war." Yeah. I don't know if I would agree with them, but I would respect them for for not trying to, to feed some cockamamie story, you know. But maybe it's maybe it's job security for some of those folks. Um, maybe uh, in this case, there were Cold War concerns or something. Sure. Yeah. That Anyways, makes sense. Yeah. It all makes sense. I say, hey, look, we get the government that we get, not the one that we want necessarily <laughs> pretty much across the board. But I do I do wonder what the actual long term benefit of these kinds of things are, because it seems like they're not very good at keeping secrets. And some of the secrets they keep, I don't fully understand the, the rationale behind. Think about the problem that would create in your mind if you were in the shoes of Heineck or one of these other people who's actually doing these blue book investigations. You know that there are secret government programs that are need to know, and you are currently not somebody who needs to know. You just are tasked with finding out what the reports are and if there's any significance. It doesn't mean they're going to read you in to the need to know special, the special, uh, what is it called, Ben? The, the special programs, the special operations programs, or whatever they're called, special use programs, what, whatever the thing was, right? Like, it doesn't mean you're going to know all that stuff. But you're tasked, in a way, with keeping that stuff still secret. I just wonder what that does with your head if you're the one investigating. You Probably recognize it all by, kinds of up. Yeah, you recognize it by the uh, the feeling of running into invisible barriers, right? Mm -hmm. Because you don't need to know. But uh, you are so it's like you hit a force field. An invisible yeah. stone wall. Uh, and it's you like in uh, Elden Ring magic. when you're chasing invisible turtles, you know? Yes. Yep. Yep. You know it by its absence. Not, and you know it by its ripples, just like the invisible turtles. That is a very small pro tip. Uh, so curiouser and curiouser. Yeah, let's give some air to the skeptical side of the story because I think skeptics bring up some good points here. First... Going back on the need-to-know basis, just because many of the people involved at the time could not nail down a mundane explanation does not mean that such an explanation does not exist. It's a weird way to phrase it, but it's true. Just rewind it and think about 
Think about how true that is. As the years wind on and the great game of telephone continues, more and more people came up with different explanations and more and more people dove into increasingly less spooky, more mundane theories about these incidents. For a time, and this is, this is one of the ones that was very, very popular for quite a while. For a time, there was a popular theory that blamed the whole thing on that supervillain, NASA. <laughs> yes, NASA. Uh, NASA. The idea was that they were testing an early engineering model of a lunar probe called Surveyor that would later go to the moon in 1966. This is true. Surveyor's a real thing. The testing was done out of an Air Force base in New Mexico, Holloman, that's at the White Sands Missile Range. Researchers looking into this did find proof that the Surveyor was being carried by a helicopter on the same day as the sighting, but not at the same time. And if you look at where this helicopter was probably flying, it's if it's on the same day, it doesn't matter if it's not in the same general area. And it was probably flying about almost 100 miles, 93 miles, 150 kilometers from Socorro as the spacecraft flies. And then mm. this is where, we, yeah, no, no apologies. <laughs> no, no wordplay left behind. And then let's go to Brian Dunning at Skeptoid, who points out even more problems with the NASA lunar probe theory. Oh, uh, yeah, we can jump through this one. This is at least Dunning's take. And Dunning makes a great point. You're saying, Ben, that this place is very far away where they would have been flying this experimental spacecraft or uh, experimental space traveler or moon moon craft. Maybe it's a moon craft. We call it that. Um, uh, it was too far away. And, and what Dunning is saying is that why, why would NASA, why would they choose to move this thing so far away and like let the regular civilians see it? Like why? Why would they do that? Because it's because it's rogue, baby. It's well, rogue. But but think about the tensions that exist at the time about why it was so important to be sending things no, to the moon. <laughs> like it would have been a boneheaded move. That's for sure. An eggheaded move, even. And may, and maybe that's what happened. But it just seems v very unlikely that that would actually occur. That they would have lost track of one of these. Is that what you're saying? Like they would have not uh, had it completely under lockdown. No. Well, yeah. Like flown it. No, not lost track of it, but just flown it near civilians in that way rather than keeping but it near that, their but, secret. But, but when we say rogue, doesn't that mean someone like went too far with it or stole it? It'd be weird to steal it. It'd be possible, but it'd be, it'd be weird for someone to be interested in that, in that level. I, I think for me, another thing that, uh, really challenges the surveyor theory is just the physical appearance of what is being reported, which sounds a lot like an oval or a balloon. But if you want to go to your browser of choice, you can get a look at the surveyor lunar lander. It looks like a lot of different shapes, none of which are balloons. It's kind of a tripod structure. It's got some solar panels, you know, popping out uh, at the top and it's got a bunch of instruments, you know, it, it, it looks like it looks like a lunar lander of that time. It does not look like an alien craft unless, you know, you yourself are an alien and you've never heard of humans. There's another damning nail in the coffin here. Surveyor doesn't have liftoff capability. Mm. It, it was never designed to hop back up. It goes down, it doesn't come up. And so it wouldn't be able to physically do what this, what Zamora's sighting or thing that he saw does. And this is where we get to one of the last uh, proposed explanations, which I think is not perfect, but it's kind of funny. Socorro isn't a big town, but it is home to a place called New Mexico Tech. In 1968, there's this chemist named Lioness Pauling. Two-time Nobel Prize winner, serious dude. He's controversial for some of his later in life views, as Dunning points out. But he writes to then president of uh, New Mexico Tech, a guy with an awesome, weird name, Sterling Colgate. 
That's his real name. Uh, and he says, basically, he and Sterling are in contact. And he says, what do you think about this whole Lonnie Zamora thing? And Colgate replies, short and sweet. We're just going to read you the exact quote. I have a good indication of student who engineered hoax. Wait for it. Student has left. Cheers, Sterling. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this is a this is a written uh, this is a written missive. Or this is a written communication, like a like a shorthand tossed off email, basically. You know what I mean? Uh huh. Yeah, classic. He's giving it that much right? attention, that much, uh, <laughs> you know, that he's not even he's like not even uh, writing in complete sentences. I like that. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that is that it's a prank. That the long story short, the idea that would be proposed by many skeptics is that some kids over at New Mexico Tech got a big, big balloon and they set it aloft using some sort of incendiary, well, not even explosive device, like a big candle, right? And that carried it aloft and then it came back down, they lit it back up again and boom, you have your UFO. But if that is the case, we could reasonably ask, in all the decades since, why has not one of those students come forward to claim responsibility? Here is something that I think is pretty understandable for any, any pranks folk in the audience. Let's say you pull a good prank, right? You get the school mascot on top of the roof of, of your alma mater, or you steal uh, the hand of a statue or something like that. And you all have your yucks and your ha-has. And then the next day, the cops show up. And then later that afternoon, the FBI shows up. And then a couple days later, the Air Force is there. Oh, and the Army swings by. Oh, and they're swarming your town. Oh, and they're not leaving. Oh, and reporters are showing up. Maybe, maybe you would want to lay low. You know what I mean? Maybe you would or, want to. Or, and hear me out, guys, just post the whole thing on TikTok after that. You'd be famous. Yeah. Yeah, this was before this was before that era where everybody felt required to do that kind of stuff and worship at the altar of self. Uh, and maybe it was a better world, but that's kind of where we're at. So to sew up Lonnie Zamora's life, and I should say Lonnie was just his nickname. He never legally changed it, but uh, to sew up Lonnie's life, he never was a crackpot. He told the truth to the best of his ability from his perspective, and he really did not try to make outlandish conclusions. He wasn't out to like sell a ton of books and be a grifter. Uh, he eventually, in fact, got so tired of people bothering him about this, he retired. He retired from the public eye. Uh, he had a series of different non-law enforcement jobs, uh, he, you know, uh, and he passed away peacefully November 2nd, 2009. And as of 2022, there are still tons of people who will tell you they know exactly what it was Zamora saw. Some will say it was definitely Nephilim, definitely an alien craft. Some will say it was definitely an experimental government skunk works type thing and some will say it was definitively a hoax or a balloon and some people will say there's not enough information to say for sure and in this case as of now that last group by default seems the closest to the truth and one person will say it was definitely robin williams doing a screen test as mork <laughs> and that person is <laughs> Our one and only Matt Mr. Frederick. Matt Frederick <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Noel Nephilim Brown. Uh, <laughs> that's me. That's, that's awesome. So at this point, we want to hear we want to hear your take on this, because, you know, with a lot of these stories, as time passes, some of the genuine evidence gets lost to time, especially the recollections of the people who were there when things went down. And then on the other side of that, the noise increases and more and more rumors or conjectures get confused with fact. So we want to know what you think, what happened back there in New Mexico. Uh, we can't wait to hear your take. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we try to be easy to find online. We do indeed. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on Twitter at the handle Conspiracy Stuff. You can find us on Instagram at Conspiracy Stuff Show. But wait, would you like to use your mouth to communicate with us uh, verbally, uh, auditorily? You can do that as well in more of an old school fashion by giving us a telephone call.
Our number is 1833STDWYTK. STDWYTK. <laughs> Um, morning, evening, afternoon, whatever time. Yes. There's no, there's no time like the present. The afternoon is the most delightful for us, I would say. Uh, here we go. When you call in, please give yourself a cool nickname, and then you have three minutes towards... You can say anything you want. We want to hear your opinions on things. We want to hear stories you want us to cover. We want to hear absolutely everything. What's that weird thing that happened with your cat? Oh, we're into it. Let us know. Um... At some point, please let us know if we can use your voice and message on the air in one of our listener mail episodes. We very much appreciate that. And uh, if you've got more to say, you've got documents or links or anything like that you want to share, why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email? We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.